Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful once again that we can uh, gather together on Zoom uh, to study your word. We need your Holy Spirit to teach us, to instruct us. And Lord, we um, know that there is a reason for all the things that we have experienced in this movement and the present state and condition of this movement. We just pray, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit can help us sort through these truths as we see what's unfolding in your word. We pray for those searching for life that you can guide and direct them. We pray for Elder Jeff in the, the uh, papers that he's uh, putting out that you can guide him. And uh, we pray, Lord, that your work will go forward according to thy will. Uh, be with us now through thy spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So this uh, series of studies that we're doing right now, uh, dealing with, or this part of the studies, dealing with the kings of Persia, um, there's a lot of detail. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying this history over the last 10 years. And um, there's still much that is debated and not well understood. Um, was actually looking this morning at the Behustin inscription, if that's how it's pronounced, I'm not sure. Uh, this is an inscription that was uh, found a long, long time ago. Um, Behistun, Behistun, it's B-E-H-I-S-T-U-N. And um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, let me see if I can show you what this looks like. <clears throat> Um, you've got a picture of the whole thing or not. So this was an inscription that was done. Um, is it showing it? No, it doesn't look like it. So hang on. Let's try this again. There we go. So this is actually an inscription in carved in limestone uh, that was made by Darius the Persian. So this is pretty old. It's 500 BC. Um, this inscription, it's uh, what they call bas relief. Um, so it's carved um, with all of this canoe form. Inscription that has Elamite. Um, uh, I can't remember the different language. Elamite's one of them, Persian and uh, Babylonian, I believe. Uh, inscriptions. So it's in three different languages. It was used, obviously, to uh, to un to, to compare these different languages. Yeah, so Babylonian, Median, and Media, Babylonian, Ekbatana, <coughs> respectively. So uh, it was carved, the ancient road that connected the capitals of Babylonia, Media, and Ekbatana. So remember, Ekbatana was the place where they found uh, these documents, that is Cyrus's uh, um, decree. So, um, so what does it say here? Um, yeah, so it's in, Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian, right? So, uh, which is a variety of Akkadian. So you can see here, this picture kind of shows you a little better angle, how you can see this is written. And it's basically, you can see all this writing on here, it's uh, uh, Darius's autobiography, right? So it's the story of Darius. And um, so there's a lot of archeological evidence um, 
in this period of history that we're studying in connection with um, and so I'm just trying to get to the right page here. So I don't know how, how familiar people are with this history. Now, we're dealing with uh, false smyrtis, right? So that's one of the things that we've addressed is, is false smyrtis who, um, I'm just looking, you don't need to see Romanian there. <clears throat> and there's a debate now. So if you look up false smyrtis, uh, the, the modern theory is that that Darius's idea that this was not uh, Smyrtus, that he was an imposter, is just propaganda, and that, that modern scholarship leans towards the idea that he actually was Smyrtus um, and was then murdered, so that he was the rightful one to the throne, and then was murdered by the Darius. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, so that's that's the modern opinion. Though it's it's I wouldn't say it's the majority opinion because um, there are a variety of different opinions. Uh, but belief that it's it actually wasn't Smyrtus, that it was an imposter, is the view that's taken in the spirit of prophecy. Now somebody could argue, well. They didn't know about this other new theory when Ellen White wrote. And so, you know, we could adapt and say, well, Ellen White was wrong. She just was repeating what people understood. But actually, in looking at the evidence, <coughs> I think it's most likely that it was false smirtus. It was an imposter. And um, he's going to uh, uh, be killed by Darius on the 10th day of the seventh month on the Babylonian calendar. So that's going to be the ninth day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar. Um, but it's the 10th day of the seventh month on the Babylonian. It's September 29th, uh, 522 BC. So, um, so we know that Darius makes this decree, right? That he does this examination, right? And and it was found in Akmetha. We know that's actually Ekbatana in the palace there in the province, that this, this decree of Cyrus is found. And so they find this. Now, it says in the first year of Cyrus the king, right? So we know that when we've studied this, when we we're studying Daniel uh, chapter 10, and it talks about the third year of Cyrus, that the first year of Cyrus is the third year of Cyrus, that it's the third year from when Babylon fell, so you could count Cyrus's reign in various ways. And so he's technically the king of Babylon um, when his uncle Darius the Mede passes away in uh, the fall of 537 BC. But you can count in the spring there, you can count that as his third year, or you could count it as his first year, depending on which way you're looking at it. And we know since um, in Daniel chapter 1, uh, the last verse tells us that Daniel continues even unto the first year of Cyrus. And then we have the fact that Cyrus, that it's referred to as the third year of Cyrus in chapter 10. Obviously, he it must be the same year. It must be the same period of time, just referred to as the third year. OK, so now we have Darius here and we've established that we had um, in between Darius, uh, according to the scriptures, we had a person who was called Ahasuerus. That's in Ezra 4, verse 6. And we know that that Ahasuerus is Cambyses. And then in the days of Artaxerxes in Ezra 4, verse 7, that's false smyrtus. And that we had these two different searches. Now, one of the things we talked about yesterday that, that I thought was interesting is the fact that when uh, they are seeking, that is, the Samaritans are seeking and they're talking to Judah 
and they're saying, we, we want to help you, they're going to refer to the days of Esther Hayden, since the days of Esther Hayden. But when we have this letter to false Smyrtas, they're not going to refer back to Esther Hayden. They're going to refer back to a snapper, however you say that. Now, that's going to be Asher Banapal, right? He's the son of Esther Hayden. So they're going to refer to that. Now, there could be um, a political reason for that because we have Esther Hayden is both the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon, where um, his son Asher Banapal is just the king of Assyria. And so by just associating him with Assyria rather than Babylon, um, that may be looked upon more favorably since Assyria no longer exists, but Babylon um, and, and Babylon, in a sense, no longer exists, but it's it's a recent enemy, right? So, um, so that could be why they, they they present the idea that this is in the time of Asher Banipal. And we can see that their letter to uh, false Smyrtis is very political. Everything that they're saying there is to direct um, false Smyrtis to look at uh, the Babylonian records. So they're going to look in the Babylonian Chronicles. They're going to find that, yes, this city of Jerusalem, Judah, they've been rebellious. You know, they have, they've rebelled against the king of, of, of Babylon. And so they're going to rebel against you, right? Um, now, when we get to um, the decree of Darius, uh, so we're going to go five here. So uh, when they go to this um, in the time of Darius, and they're going to appeal to Darius, right? After they begin building this uh, this temple, uh, they're going to write a letter, and this is going to direct them to Cyrus's decree. So the other letter never directed them to Cyrus's decree, but in this letter they're not doing as good a job from the perspective of trying to stop the Jews because they're actually telling the, the true story of what the Jews said. And so then they're going to do this search and this search is going to reveal um, that yes, indeed Cyrus did make this decree and that this is going to take time for this to occur where in the other case, it wouldn't have taken as much time. Um, and we know it, it, it's going to happen in the time of false Smyrtis, who's only uh, in charge for about seven months. So, so it's some, something that's done, you know, just rather quickly. They find, yes, the Babylonian Chronicles say this is a bad city, right? Now here, this search is going to take much longer. They're directed to look um, in the treasures that were laid up in Babylon, but instead they're going to find this in Ekbatana, like Akmetha in here in the King James. So in the province of the Medes, right? So they find Cyrus's decree. Now, um, now we had, uh, there was another point here. Oh, um, trying to remember what it was that we had noticed. Okay, so anyway, so when they look at this decree, um, it's, it's going to talk about all the things that happened that supported this, and Darius then uh, supports this decree. And um, so this decree then is going to be issued. We're saying that it's in 516 BC in the summer, and that it's going to help complete the temple. It's going to be finished and dedicated on March 12th, 515 BC, which is the third day of the 12th month, the inversion, um, in the year 516. That is, if you're going from spring to spring, the spring of 516 to the spring of 515, it's going to be the third day of the 12th month. So that's going to be in March, <clears throat> right? So, and, and then what's going to happen is we're going to have uh, this um, Passover. 
So they're going to have the dedication and this Passover. Now, this was part of, um, I guess, a key in understanding Millerite history. So uh, let's see if I can find it quickly here. Okay, so. So this this is a this chart here that you're going to see is a rather complicated chart. Um, it has lots of information on it. Um, this is the chart that shows uh, events in uh, the time of the decrees. Actually, it even goes all the way back to dates from 977 BC, and then the top part is Samuel Snow's letters. So I know if just looking at it, it's it's a busy busy mess. But what I want to direct your attention to is Samuel Snow's letters here. So remember, Samuel Snow, he writes his first letter that's published on February 16th, 1844. Now that is his first draft of what later will be published on August 22nd, 1844, as the true midnight cry. So remember that Samuel Snow on January 1st, the first day of the first month, he's going to resolve that he's going to present to the Millerites that Jesus is not coming back in the spring, that he's coming back in the fall because the prophetic periods end in the fall of 1844. He'd given his personal testimony on uh, December 31st, on New Year's Eve, at the Boston Tabernacle, and then he's going to... Uh, make this resolution um, that he's going to do this. So he puts together his ideas and presents them in this letter written on February 6th, 16th, 1844. Now that date that he writes that on the biblical calendar, it's the third day of the 12th month. That is, it's the same date that in 515 BC is the date of the dedication of the temple. Now, when I first had found this date of the dedication of the temple, the third day of the 12th month, being March 12th, that is the third month, 12th day, it was the first example I had of something like that, where you have this date as a symbol and it's an inversion. And so I paid attention to it, but it, it was gonna be a few years later when I would start studying Samuel Snow's letters, and that biblical date jumped out at me, the third day of the 12th month. Now, it's not going to be March 12th in 1844. It's going to be February 16th, right? So, so this is the 16th day of the second month, and uh, in this uh, diagram here, you can see if we count uh, two months and 16 days. So the second month, 16th day, February 16th. From that date, it's going to bring us to Samuel Snow's second letter, which is on the Passover, May 2nd. But that's the true Passover. If we look at when his letter is written and when it is uh, republished, so it's going to be first written and published, you know, uh, six days later. So it's going to be written on February 16th, published February 22nd. And, and February 22nd then is, um, oh, pardon me, I, I got this backwards. So February 22nd is the third day of the 12th month, right? So, so it's going to be uh, February 22nd. So that was when it was published. So, so when it's published the first time, and it's published the, se the second time. That is the same dates that we have in 515 BC. That is, it's the third day of the 12th month and the 14th day of the first month. So I'm, I'm correcting myself here. So we have these two dates. So let's go back here to Ezra chapter 6 to see the importance of this. So it's going to give us two dates. The first date is when the temple is dedicated and that's going to be on the 
as it says in Ezra 6.15, on the third day of the month, Adar. Adar is the 12th month. It's kind of interesting, too, that the word Adar, the Hebrew number is 144, right? So that's 12 times 12. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, and just uh, here. Now, this is the Aramaic version of Adar, so not the Hebrew version of Adar. By the way, so this is Aramaic word, and it happens to be 144. So we have that symbol there in this verse. And then they're going to have the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. So when Samuel Snow's letter is first published, it's going to be on the third day of the 12th month, and then it's going to be republished on the 14th day of the first month. So can we see the significance in this, these two dates, this dedication of the temple and this publish and, and this Passover with the two different publishings of this first letter that's written on February 16th? Can, can we see that that is very significant? That this, this isn't just chance. Correct. Okay. So, so this is something that ties uh, Darius's decree, the second decree. It ties us to Millerite history. And, and I've made a case that all of these decrees, Cyrus's decree, Darius's decree, the events under Darius's decree, and what happens in Artaxerxes' decree, are all representative of events in Millerite history, particularly Samuel Snow's letters and the acts of Samuel Snow. And that's very profound. Now, it's rather complicated. That is, you have to have a lot of information to understand it and appreciate it. But this is something that we can see. Now, the writing of the first letter. So when I had gone through this in 2017 and I had uh, laid out Samuel Snow's letters and found all these different dates. So I found, you know, his second letter is published also on Passover, but this time it's the true Passover. So instead of being the 14th day of the 13th month on the biblical calendar, as as uh, which the Jews had as the 14th day of the first month, April 3rd, that's when his first letter is published the second time. The true Passover is going to be a month later, May 2nd. Um, and and for each of these, I could find, you know, significance. So when his letters are published, there's all these significant. I'm not going to go through all the letters here. But then, you know, we had when it was written, and that was the one where I had the dream to do this, right? So I, I, I was struggling. What do I do with this first letter? It doesn't fit in. Now, we know later in 2018 that this structure of Samuel Snow's letters is going to uh, occur in that prediction, right? The prediction for November 9th. And it's also going to be tied to the July 18th date. So I'm not going to go through that. But we can see that this history here, um, what we have found in this history, the reason why it's important is we know that we can tie these events of these decrees to our time, right? So so that's an important point. So when we put these on a line, which is what we're starting to do now, starting to put these on a line, we have to keep in mind the fact that not only can we compare this uh, with our history, but that we can also connect it to a line in Millerite history. Right? And we know in order to understand the present, we have to understand the past. <clears throat> Now, um, so there, there's a whole bunch of complexities that, that this movement has to address at the present time. So one of the things that we have to address is um, this simple fact that um, we have passed through events in our history that not all are agreed upon, right? So, so we know 
and we started drawing this line here, so I'm just bringing it up. <clears throat> so, so we have some uh, uh, occurrences that have that have happened recently. So we know that Jeff is is writing again, and um, you know there is a comment in the Unity group uh, where somebody says. Uh, we thank God for that wonderful report. This is a report that Stephen Jameson uh, placed in the Unity Group, somebody named Constantine. And I'm sure it's, it's not his real name. It could be, I guess. But may the power of the Holy Spirit continue using Elder Jeff, that all that what, all what went wrong be corrected. Praise be the Lord our God in capital letters. Now, if we think about this, um, can Jeff come in and correct all that went wrong? Would it be wrong to say, well, Jeff can now come in and he can correct everything that went wrong? I don't think he can. I think he needs help. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd really be happy if Jeff, you know, came and started studying all of this light that's come since July 18th. Maybe he has. I don't know. But we understand from the lines that, uh, that the corrections really are being made already, right? Now, I don't know who this Constantine guy is, or what his perspective is. He may feel, you know, that, uh, you know, there was all these mistakes made. Maybe it's time setting, all, all these types of things. And you know, we have to go back to some, you know, earlier understanding of this message. He might have that opinion. I don't know. He might it, he might be addressing something completely different. He may think about all the divisions that have happened in the movement. Maybe Jeff can come and help unite this movement again and bring us together. I don't know. The only thing I do know is that this movement, if Jeff comes back into the movement and starts actively, you know, presenting. Right now he's just writing articles. Um, and he starts addressing the various things that are happening in the movement, the various personalities, who's right and who's wrong, that that would be very destructive to everything that God has done in the last three years. I don't know if people agree with me on that. I would say, yeah. Yeah. What? Everybody's looking to, a lot of people are looking at Jeff. Right. And I mean, I'd be happy to look to Jeff too and just say, man, I, I can step out of out of this limelight. Jeff can just take over again and we can just go back to how things were. It'd be much easier, right? But that's not generally how God works. So, um, so we have as individuals a responsibility to understand truths for ourselves. We know that a lot of the mistakes, if we want to say that were made, were were made in the sense of who was being trusted and you know to just say well we're going to leave that responsibility of deciding what truth is because that's kind of what i think people um, want is you know somebody could step in like jeff that everybody respects and he could just say well well here's the here's how we correct these problems you know what Theodore's teaching here is wrong, what Colin's teaching is wrong, or whatever it is, you know, and here's what we should be understanding, here's what we should be studying. Uh, a lot of people would follow Jeff, right? He could just say, you know, these people are teaching error, they're fanatics, and, and that's where we would be. But if we look at these lines, so one of the reasons I believe that God has been giving us these lines to look at, to understand, is so that we individually can sort through and decide what is truth for ourselves. It's so much easier to depend upon another person, right? Because if there's just some person we can trust, then, then I don't really have to think too hard. I don't really have to understand the truths for myself. Right. I can just say, well, Jeff says this and that's good enough for me. Right. A person doesn't have to study the 2520 
if their pastor just says, it's error, don't look at it. Or if, or if they just say, well, James White rejected it. You know, he, he wrote uh, an article in the Adventist Review, you know, back in uh, 1864, uh, whatever it was, January 24th, 1864. Um, and he said, you know, it's not, it's not a time prophecy. And that's good enough for me, right? Then I don't have to look at it. And we know that we're in the time where God is saying, we have to examine these truths for ourselves, right? We can't right. be trusting in man. And, and that's not as... It's, it's not easy, but it's the responsibility that we've all been given for our own soul, soul salvation. So as we begin to look at these lines, as we're looking at this controversy, because, you know, people see this as sort of, this is debate between me and Colin in some ways, right? Now, I'm not saying everybody would look at it that way, but, but some people would say, well, you know, Colin has a view, Theodore has a view. Colin asked me to do this study, right? Because he wants to understand where I think that he's made an error. And, and the thing is, I don't fully understand the whole issue, right? I know where, what type of error it is. That is, it's an error addressing the lines, having to do with not understanding where we are in the lines. And it parallels the error of the Millerites in being unable to distinguish between literal and spiritual in their application and in the ignoring of other beliefs or understanding of prophecy, setting things aside. And so my view is if we're going to understand what the light that God gave Colin and also the light that God gave Odilio, you know, 49 days later, that's presented 49 days later, that this light needs to be examined by this movement and it has to be done in accordance with the guidelines that were given in the spirit of prophecy and that were followed in 1850 when they made the 1850 chart. In that history, when there is a disagreement, they go to God, they come together in unity to study and discern what is truth. And when they can't agree, the Holy Spirit speaks through Ellen White. She's given a vision that resolves these problems. And so we have we have the spirit of prophecy. We have God's word. We have this system of study in order to place these things together on a line and decide for ourselves what is true. So it's difficult. It's, it's not going to be easy. And whatever we find that God brings us, and, and I believe that God is bringing this movement together to study together, that is, we have to do it. You know, definitely um, this sort of a party spirit that, you know, I'm, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. All of that type of idea has to disappear in our hearts if we're going to advance, if God's going to use us. And we all have these biases. We all have, you know, people we prefer people that we, we feel that we trust or that we like. Um, and that can't be a reason for deciding what is truth. Right? We can't decide truth based upon who we like or who our friends are. Truth has to be decided based upon God's word in spite of how it affects our friendship or relationships with others in spite of how it goes against our natural uh, proclivities. So, <clears throat> so here, here we are looking at these lines, but we're looking at them in this context. So I'm, I'm trying to provide this context of where we are right now, that, that these lines are to speak to the present situation because God wouldn't have us studying these things if they weren't addressing our present situation, right? And you know, to me, it's always amazing what we study. So Isaiah 34, 16 and 17, what is that, Angela? Verses that came to me while you were speaking. It says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. 
No oh. one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever, from generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Okay, so Isaiah 34, verse 16 and 17. Those, that definitely sounds uh, relevant for what we're discussing. Amen. Um, yeah, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read, No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. And that word line is the word, you know, kav, which is that line upon line. That's a measuring line. And they shall mm. possess it forever from generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Now, of course, this here is, is the context of here is this judgment upon the nations. And... Um, it's kind of a rather cryptic chapter in Isaiah, but uh, we can see how this counsel applies to us at the present time. So we can trust that God is leading this movement, and we can trust that that any of the mistakes that were made were providential, right? So we have a group of people who believe mistakes were made, and we have to sort of go back, correct the mistakes. You know, get back on track, so to speak. Uh, the movement has wandered away um, from whatever they believe that uh, the movement should have been doing. And um, so then, uh, you know, now if we can just be corrected, uh, Jeff could correct us, somebody could correct us, and then we wouldn't have to worry anymore. We could, we could be certain about what we believe. But we know that that's not the case, that the mistakes is not to go back and find that the movement went off course, that the movement has been led by God all the way through this history. Right. That's that's what we believe. And that everything that was done was not a mistake in the sense that we had wandered away from God and we have to repent and confess our sins and go back. It was just a mistake, the same mistakes the Millerites made, right? So they made mistakes. Now, was there a group that went back and said, well, we need to correct the mistakes that we made? That God wasn't leading us, that we went off course in some way. And that would be the main body of the Millerites, right? So they basically repudiated everything that had gone before. We had the wrong date. Um, you know, obviously the seventh month movement was just a delusion. You know, Jesus didn't come back October 22nd, 1844. You know, so now we have to sort of go back to the drawing board. But then you had the group of Millerites that later become Adventists who recognize God's leading through that whole period. And that's where we are at. We believe that God was leading in spite of the fact that the prediction that was made did not come to pass. Right. So. So this is going to be, if it's true that, you know, Jeff's going to start coming back into the movement and addressing these things in that way, what people want. I don't know if Jeff's going to do that. I, I don't think he's going to. Um, but if he does, because that's what people want, um, I don't think it will be good for the movement. Unless Jeff is going to just accept the light that has been coming to this movement for the last three years. If he becomes a participant in that, that would be good. But that's not what people want, right? You know, if there was as, a disagreement, what's that? As a question. Okay. If we are truly repeating Millerite history, mm -hmm. did William Miller come back into the work after he had withdrawn himself from it? Um, well, it's, it's not really that clear cut. I mean, we know that he still, he still had an influence, right? But much of what has been being addressed within the movement right now 
has been because of the influence of Elder Jeff. Mm. Yeah. And at this point, if Elder Jeff were to come back in, there would be some that would accept him. There would be others that likely would reject him. Yeah, I don't think you could reject Jeff. I mean, you could disagree with it, maybe, if he had some things. Um, I, I would think it would be more that if Jeff came back in and did what people want, that he would he would start to do what he did in the past, which I don't think was good, where he decides that somebody's teaching heresy without actually having a discussion about what the person's teaching. Okay. Right? That happened, right? So we had... He listened to rumors. He trusted people about what was being said by others. And that influenced him to to make statements about other people that weren't necessarily completely true and alienated those people from the movement. And so, uh, you know, we have to be careful that, you know, however, however whatever is going to happen, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm just addressing that point that, if we're going to look at what's going to guide us from now on, it can't be a person, right? There can't be, you know, we can't go back and revive FFA as an organization and try to do what was being done in the past. Right. Right. I understand that that's what people would want. I personally would want it, you know, from, from a human perspective. It'd just be so much easier, right? Um, but somehow God is working in a way where he has taken the work into his own hands. And, you know, I bring up here, you know, with the R Romani people, right, the, the gypsies, um, you know, here I'm presenting, and, and there seems to be, from what they're saying, this uh, response to... Uh, these simple presentations on Daniel chapter 9. I mean, they're very simple, what I'm presenting. But to them, it's new light. Uh, the leader there said in, in the study last night um, that uh, even though they know Daniel chapter 9, that they're seeing things in Daniel chapter 9 they never saw. And I've just done some very simple presentations. I've done two presentations. Really, it's be about like 15, 20 minutes if you just took what I presented uh, for each of those studies, you know, maybe, so maybe a half an hour presentations and they're already seeing things and they're excited about it, but also the people, because this is an evangelistic series, the people are interested in it, right? So there's something that God is doing because of light that has been given to us. And this was my belief is that that God has been giving this movement light and that we haven't really been sharing it. That is, because even within the movement itself, the light isn't understood, right? So God gave us all this light and we're, we're not even really appreciating what he's given us, the power of the truths of God's word that have been unfolding to us. We haven't had the time, we haven't taken the time to share it. Now, I know that every time I've shared it with non-Adventists, it's been very, very powerful. But Adventists don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about things they've never heard of before. Because if it's something they've never heard before, generally speaking, they just think it's error, right? They don't know how to evaluate it. It's just error, right? It's new. You're saying something I never heard before? I don't want to hear it, right? But here we have, and it's interesting, the, the people there, what they were telling me is that None of the people there in their group even have um, an elementary school education other than the pastor. Um, so or for the most part, these people are uneducated. And yet, you know, God is going to use the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Right. Not many mighty, not many great men can God use, but he can use those that don't trust in self, that trust in him, right? So I believe that there's a power there in, in the simplicity of God's word, because really there is a simplicity in 
the messages that we have. If you compare what we are teaching to scholarly work, it's much simpler, right? You can get those uh, books, you know, the Daniel and Revelation Study Committee. Um, you know, we have these great scholars who put together all this work trying to support the traditional view of the prophecies of the 2300 days and, and the 70 weeks, right, the year-day principle. But the average person, those, those books are inaccessible to them, right? Agreed. But there is a simplicity in, in showing from the scriptures the, the story of Ezra, the story of Daniel. One is it's, it's a story, it's a narrative that people can attach themselves to. And, and, and the appeal that I've been making with uh, the Romani people is showing Daniel's captivity because there are a people that was, were oppressed. They were slaves, right? And, and so the, the scripture songs that I'm singing, the, uh, the, the emphasis that I have in what I'm presenting, I'm presenting, you know, Daniel as this, this captive in Babylon longing to be delivered from that captivity and, and paralleling that to the sin in our lives. And, and so this becomes a very powerful and simple illustration. So, so this movement, I believe, has been lacking this type of understanding that what we've been doing is debating, you know, taking sides, we have having a party spirit, instead of saying, what is God wanting to show to us about ourselves? And so when we look at these lines and we look at this history, we know that we have to understand this history as it relates to this movement, but more specifically as it relates to our individual responsibility to understand what is truth and to share that truth with those around us, however God uh, has that happen. Okay, so... So I know we're supposed to be putting these things on a line. We spent, we haven't drawn anything on a line here yet. But straighten out the line a little bit. <clears throat> but but we're we're doing this line of the temple. So we have uh, the fall of Jerusalem, specifically the temple is destroyed on the tenth day of the fifth month in 586 BC. We have these 49 years. And, and Dwight has pointed out these 49 years, a jubilee cycle that relates to these other jubilee and sabbatical cycles in the 70 weeks that ties to these different histories. And, and so, you know, it's something that we have to keep in mind as we, we look at this. Now, we know that this sabbatical cycle does not line up with, this, with the 49 years from 457 to uh, uh, 408 BC, right? So that 49 years doesn't mesh with this 49 years. So we know that that these, at least symbolically, are sabbatical cycles. So Cyrus comes to the throne in the fall of 537, and so that's going to be 49 years. And then the next fall, on the first day of the seventh month, the Jews under Cyrus's decree that's going to happen midway between there, uh, we're going to have this altar being built, right? So, um, so we need to put this decree here. So I'm going to do it like this. And so we have Cyrus decree. And we're saying that this decree is going to be the 24th day of the first month. 14th, it's 24th. 24th day of the first month. That's when Cyrus's decree is issued. Based on my interpretation that when the battle is being fought, it's Cyrus decides to make this decree. So I assume just he makes the decree that day. So it's an assumption. But, but that's the date that we're given in scriptures, the 24th day of the first month. And I think that's definitely is connected to his decree because it's going to take about four months for them to return 
obviously when he makes his decree it's at the end of the first month so maybe in the second month they're going to um, sometime in the second month maybe the end of the second month they're going to begin their journey under this decree and then they're going to return to Jerusalem and they're going to build this altar and so we're saying that that's the Jubilee right so we can see that's the 50th year and so Cyrus's decree is there in the middle of this so we don't know the date for Cyrus's accession um, but we do have the date for the decree and we have the date for the building of the altar okay any thoughts on this so far Not quite yet. Okay. So then the next event that we're going to have is uh, the laying of the foundation, right? That's the next uh, event. So they're going to lay this foundation. So you have the foundation of the temple is going to be begun, and that's going to be on. The second, so I'm going to do it this way because we don't know the date. It's just going to be the second month of the second year. I'll we'll do it that way. And that's going to be in 535 BC. Okay. <clears throat> now, connected with this story is going to be. Uh, two groups of people, right? There's going to be a group of people that is going to um, mourn the laying of this foundation, right? Because they had seen Solomon's temple. So we're just going to put here two groups characterized by joy and sorrow. Okay, so what is this, what is this representing? Wise and foolish. Also, I noted that the fact that they built the, the altar first, isn't that a call for us to repent first? to be right with God, and then we can lay the foundation properly? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good understanding there. Now, if we look at this as a line, um, now we know that Cyrus comes to the throne, it's at the end of the 70 years, right? So I'm just going to move a bit of this over. Um, but, you know, because we can put here in this line, uh, we can put, you know, this is going to be, I know this isn't, you know, 100% uh, in proportions, all these different things. But, you know, you can put oh, here put here 607, so in uh, the fall of 607 B.C. Right. So we got two different periods um, that are being addressed here, right? That is, the time of the end... I mean, and, and we've already know that there's the 70 years for Babylon as well. So, I mean, we didn't even put in here the 70 years for Babylon, but we're, we're just taking that out. Um, uh, just it's the 70 years at Babylon that we're addressing. So that's the cap, the, the Babylonian captivity. But we know here then that we have two different periods because you've got the 49 years here. And then you have the 70 years, right? So we know there's 21 years between Daniel's captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem. And then there's 49 years from the destruction of Jerusalem to uh, Cyrus coming to the throne. So you understand what I'm doing here? So we got these 70 years. Okay. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, so the time in the end there. What's this thing here? I don't know what that was. It says I disappeared. Okay. Am I back? Oh, I, yeah, I disappeared as a person. I see what you're saying. Um, let's hang on. It's just not that you really need to see me, but. You're back. Then I'm back. Okay. It's just a technical issue. <clears throat> okay. So Piran had pointed out that uh, you know, I disappeared in the picture. <clears throat> so, so we have this time of the end. So we can say that Cyrus coming to the throne is the time of the end. And we could say that the decree is the formalization and the building of the altar is the uh, empowerment of the first message. Could we do that? So we could say the first angel arrives. You could say the first message, but I'll put it in angel. Right? And then it's going to be formalized with the decree itself. And then it's going to be empowered when they build this altar because they've returned, right? They built this altar. Does that make sense as a line? So that's just a suggestion. And any discussion on this? Okay, I can't quite hear you, Stephen. It was just garbled. Can you try it again? Hi. I can hear you now. Okay. I'm just saying, when about the formalization? Would you not say that's when the, the altar is built then? It would be formalized? Uh, when they build the altar? Yes. That's, that's a possibility, right? So, so we could say, okay, that's the formalization. Now, now, the first angel does arrive. We could say Cyrus's decree is an increase of knowledge or something, right? It's just that the decree is such a powerful waymark. So we wouldn't make the decree the time of the end, the arrival of the first message. But, but, but I don't know. And we're saying that, of course, that formalization that I have marked here, Cyrus's decree, this is going to be Daniel chapter 10, right? So, could, but, but there is a reason why I'm going to have uh, this as the second angel arrives. So what would why would I put the foundation of the temple as the second angel arriving? I'm not saying this is right. Stephen might be right. Because um, you would then put this as the empowerment, right, of the first message? Uh, that was what I was thinking, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so any thought on this? From anyone else, and Stephen, if he has thoughts on it too. <clears throat> okay, why would I make the foundation of the temple be laid at the second angel arriving? And I could be wrong, because when we look at the foundation, um, how do we understand that in Millerite history? When is the foundation laid? The 
the charts. charts. Yeah, so, so we usually attach that to the charts, right? Now, the charts we don't really have as a way mark. That is, we don't have, you know, when we, when we put on our way, our way marks, we don't mark the charts as, you know, the empowerment of the first angel or the arrival of the second. Now, we used to put the arrival of the se second in connection with the charts um, because um, uh, the way that we understood it, we didn't really understand April 19th yet as the arrival of the second. So it was because the Protestants closed their doors to the Adventists once they came up with this definite time of, you know, 1843, not about the, the year 1843. We now started narrowing it down, or the Millerites did. And so the Protestants began to close their doors. A part of that is, is just getting closer. The Protestant churches liked the Millerites at first because it increased their coffers. It brought converts, right? But now as it's starting to get closer to this date, uh, the Protestant churches are starting to distance themselves from the Millerites. But part of that is the charts themselves. Um, so we know the foundation being laid is part of our lines. We have the foundation and then we have the work of the enemies, right? So so maybe we could just say the foundation of the temple isn't a way mark. Um, but, you know, if we're going to put it as the arrival of, or the empowerment of the first angel, we could. So I don't know if anybody wants to help try to sort this out, what we should do. It's just we do have a time at the end, right? Normally the angel arrives at the time of the end. Now we could just say that whole thing of Cyrus coming to the throne and the decree is all the arrival of the first angel. Right? We could do that. But we already sort of have two times of the ends because we do have... Uh, you know, the fall of Babylon in 539. So we already have sort of two dates that are combined to be the time of the end. And and definitely the first angel uh, formalization, a giving of, of a decree sounds like a formalization, doesn't it? Stephen, how would you sort this out? If, if you're going to do this, um, how would you address each of these waymarks? Yeah, I haven't really thought about it up too much. Okay. Now, I've thought about it a lot in the past. I mean, I've drawn out these decrees with all these different waymarks. Um, but normally I would put uh, the second angel arriving being Darius's decree, right? Because I'm dealing with all three uh, waymarks. So there is a place in where we could look at the foundation of the temple being laid as the formalization of the message. If we were on the line of the three decrees, does that make sense? Okay, so 535 is a doubling. So it, it, it's just interesting, Aran had pointed out, that we're looking at 535 BC as the second angel, this, these two groups, right? And, and he's saying that's a doubling because this is slide number 535. Yeah, so it's obviously not intentional. So in the line of the three decrees, I put the foundation of the temple as the formalization of, of the message, I believe, or at least the empowerment of the message. I think I put it as the empowerment. And then you're going to have the work of the enemies, right? So you're going to have all of these things that are going to happen after the foundation of the temple is laid. 
So you're going to have these, these two different letters that are given. Uh, the one that's going to be given uh, in false smirtus that's going to stop the work of the temple, right? So that we're going to have to say under false smirtus that the temple is going to be uh, delayed and how we would address that as a waymark. We'd have to figure that out. And then we're also going to have uh, the second decree that's going to happen with this second letter, this time written to Darius Estaspes. So that second letter then is um, going to lead to this, this decree, the second decree. Now, the second decree is the second angel's message in the line of the decrees, but this is the line of the temple. So, so in this line, we're going to have you know a second angel arriving, um, which which I'm putting at the foundation of the temple. Uh, we need a formalization event, and we need an empowerment event, right? And and in that, then we also would need an arrival of the third message of what that would be. So so we have we haven't. Done that. What did I do there? Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so the the end point you're looking at when the temple is being dedicated. Ah, yes. Okay. So I'm going to put the dedication of the temple here as the third angel arriving. Now, now, we have the dedication of the temple, and it's also going to be addressed with this Passover. But, but to me, it's just the, um, the third day of the 12th month, the temple dedication. Right. That, to me, is what I would see as the third angel arriving. Probably should have done that the other way around. So you can see why that that would be the end point, because this is the line of the temple. So that's, so that's one way of doing that. And, and so then we would have, we have the foundation of the temple as being the second angel arriving, these two different groups, we have the joy and the sorrow that's being expressed. So these are two classes foolish and the wise, right? Is this making sense so far? It has a logic to it. Okay. Now, now technically, this is 515 BC. You know, it's, we could also call it 516. You know, and I found it kind of interesting uh, when you research, you know, how people address chronology who aren't chronologists. So you, you know, if you look in Wikipedia, uh, they will have this dedication of the temple in 516 BC. But they definitely don't mean it. Right? That is, they know which year is the sixth year of... Darius, and they know that it occurs in the sixth year, and they know that the sixth year goes from the spring of 516 to the spring of 515. But they call it 516 BC, even though it's technically in 515. And that's because they don't really think about it, right? They just think the sixth year of Darius is um, in 516. And so this is in the 12th month of Darius' sixth, Darius's sixth year. So it's going to be 516, right? So uh, 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 it's hard to find 515 as a date. That is, people are not very precise when it comes to biblical dates, right? So they would call this 516 BC. But in, in a sense, it is. You could call it 516 BC. 
but technically it's not. Okay, I need an M there for your day of the twelfth month. Okay, so we should be able to place the formalization and empowerment of that second message. So um, obviously we're going to have Darius's decree in here somewhere. Ooh. And then um, and then we would have an empowerment. So what are these events? So the foundation of the temple is laid. And when, when we look at this story in, in the scripture, so let's go back there. So we have Haggai and Zechariah who are going to um, be prophesying. Now, we could also take the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah as the arrival of a second angel. So, so we, we have another symbol that would work. Um, but we could also just say that that's the formalization. Because you have two prophets. So it deals with the second angel's message. And we know that midnight is, is also the second angel's message. So you can just put here Haggai and Zechariah. So here then we're going to have, um, and, and we can put a year, I guess. We could just say it's, it's going to be in 520 that they're going to begin their prophesying. So it's, it's a doubling, midnight, midnight cry has this doubling symbol. And then I'm just going to borrow this here and put the work of the enemies. Right? So you have the work of the enemies here after the foundation is laid. So however we're going to label these things. Oh, sorry, I need to show you what I'm doing. Okay, so how does that look? Illogical. Okay. So we have Haggai and Zechariah. That's going to be the formalization of the message. So now we could we could move that over to being the second angel arriving too. We could put foundation of the temple as as just uh, the laying of the foundation after the first angel is empowered. And we could say Haggai and Zechariah is the second angel arriving. <clears throat> So, so we could. I'm not saying that one is, is is right or wrong. I don't know. This is what we've drawn out here. But we definitely would have to say that uh, the empowerment would be Darius's decree. <coughs> right? I, mean, I, I think that part would be obvious. Right. So in 516 BC. Now, one of the things, of course, we always address in when we have a a line is um, the period of darkness, right? So, so if we're looking here, uh, this particular darkness is going to be this darkness from the destruction of the temple to the accession of, of Cyrus. That is, the darkness is the fact the temple is gone, right? Because in the line of the temple, so this isn't the line of the captivity. This is more the line of the temple, correct? Agreed. Okay. So, so we're addressing the temple here, and, and that's going to be then, so this is no temple.
That's what the darkness is. There's no temple. Okay. And we would then take this 70 years here. Technically, it's 70 years and uh, from the fifth month to the 12th month. So that would be seven years and seven months, right? But we'll just say it's 70 years. So you can see this is not proportional. Oops. When uh, Jeff done his lines, I think he done the, the enemies. Uh, it was before the second angel arrives. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because you have the, the laying of the foundation and then the enemies. So normally the work of the enemies is going to be here, right, before the arrival of the second angel, right? So so that would be a case for what Stephen is saying, that um, this here is just the, it's just the foundation being laid, right? So it's not the second angel arriving. So we could move the second angel arriving to Haggai and Zechariah. Now, now we could then, you know, if we did that, so I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm just saying that we have, we do have the foundation being laid always before the enemies, right? Because once your foundation is laid, then the enemies come in. And this, this is what happens. And we can see, and it's kind of interesting, because when we had these symbols, had we had we looked at this history before or after we had the symbols of the foundation and the work of the enemies? Does anybody know? Had this line been drawn out, like the line of the three decrees, to get that terminology? Yes. Okay, are you certain? I remember Jeff dealing with the decrees. Yeah, um, but he is identifying the enemies then. Okay. After the foundation, yeah, he talked about this year line. Maybe not okay. the line of the temple, but the line of the decrees. Okay, so when would he, when would he have done that? What year? Um. Maybe 2010, around that time. Okay. Okay, so that, that's possible. Um, in, in trying to look at this myself, because we had these lines before. So, I mean, Jeff has had these lines of the three messages and so forth. And um, so it is possible. You could be right. But I, I've had the impression that he started talking about the foundation being laid even before he had looked at the foundation in the line of the decrees. Because we have because we had the foundation in connection with the charts. So we were talking about the charts as a foundation before even 9-11. Right? Uh, see, Jeff never really started dealing well. Well, I suppose he had 1842 identified. Right, because we had the foundation, because Ella White talks about examining the foundation. And so this was done early on in this movement. Um, but I'm not sure exactly when. But but I would say it's before 2010 that they already had this idea of the foundation. Now, as far as the work of the enemies, I, I think that terminology would come from the decrees. We definitely had the, the idea of the foundation uh, before that. But it's something, you know, we could look into again. But I remember going through when we were examining the foundation. In, in that series of studies, uh, that it seemed that that was what uh, uh, 
that we were seeing that that line existed prior to Jeff actually addressing the line of the three decrees. Because I, I would agree that the line of the three decrees is about in 2010, right? So that, that's quite a bit later that we're going to be addressing the decrees. So, so it's something to think about. So if we're going to put the foundation of the temple being laid, we would just have that as um, how would we, how would we address this foundation of the temple in the line? You would just say it's the formalization or the empowerment or even you would say that's the empowerment. Well, Jeff Hallett, as you had the message being empowered, and then you had the foundations, wasn't that? Or you had it, and then you, the enemies. I suppose that's this is a, a different line. Right, it's a different line. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so in this line, if we're just dealing with the line at the temple. Um, you know, I mean, we're going to have the enemies coming in at the time the foundation of the temple is being laid, right? So you're going to have all of those enemies that whole chapter four there. That's going to be um, from the time they lay the foundation when they're going to just begin to lay the foundation. We have the Samaritans come in trying to uh, be a part of this but yet they're going to be um, become the enemies, right? They're going to try to stop the building of the temple. And they, they succeed in doing that. So, I mean, you could easily put, you know, I mean, we could put Haggai and Zechariah as a new message. That's going to be a message that um, then, you know, then we have to address each of these other ones, each of these other waymarks. I mean, we could just, returning and building the altar we could we could have that as an increase of knowledge but usually an increase of knowledge is before the formalization so we could take cyrus's decree as the increase of knowledge i mean i like the line how it's laid out personally for this the line of the temple And then we can see that this darkness is no temple. So if we're looking at what this message is about, it's all about this attempt, this temple. So when Cyrus comes to the throne, um, maybe we wouldn't even have that as the time of the end. We could move Cyrus's decree to the time of the end because that's going to be a message, right? So I, I don't, I don't have the answer to that completely. So maybe we could do that. Oops. So we can come back to this tomorrow and look at it. So, so maybe we could make that the first message arise with Cyrus's decree. This that seventy years just sort of blending into that. Would, it, would that make more sense, Stephen, if we move this, all this stuff over? Yeah, so you get this one. Whoops. I guess we'd have to. This one would be here. This one would be here. This one would be here. This is all just together. Cyrus coming to the throne and his decree. Would that make more sense, Stephen? Um, potentially. <laughs> okay. Potentially? No, potentially, he yeah. said. Yeah, so so I think that would work. I'm, I'm going to change that. 
then the, the problem that we're now going to have is um, so you get the second angel arrives with the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. So how would you address this? So the this problem you could maybe say is when they actually begin to rebuild again. So they have their prophesying, then the rebuilding. So you just have another uh, way mark in here. So that's going to be the empowerment. And then they begin to rebuild. So that would be the second angel formalized. Oops. Okay. Okay. I actually like that. What, what do other people think before we close with prayer? Or do we just want to come back and look at this tomorrow and then decide? <clears throat> I think give us some time to really consider this. Okay. Well, let's close it with prayer then. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. Um, and uh, I pray, Lord, that we can continue to study these things and think about them through the day. Give us wisdom and understanding. And uh, we pray that you can uh, use us to reach others. Pray for the studies in Romania, uh, that you can continue to be with me and help me to communicate um, effectively to the hearts there. And we pray for this movement here in North America and the troubles that uh, could arise. We ask, Lord, that you can help us, give us wisdom. We pray for Jeff and for everyone in this movement. We know, Lord, that um, your work must go forward, and that we need to trust in you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.